So I will go over Russell's arguments for this theory of descriptions. So again, in the last video, I presented the theory itself of his semantic treatment of definite descriptions. And in this video, I'm going to go over the central arguments for it. So the first one, first argument, I've called the argument from falsity. So the first premise of this argument is in line one here. So we're going to, in this argument and the others, we're going to be considering an example of a definite description. And talking about this example will be a stand-in for definite descriptions in general. Okay, so the example um, here is the definite description, the present king of France. Now, as we all should know, there in fact is not a present king of France. The king of France was killed several hundred years ago, or say 200, a bit over 200 years ago. So the definite description, the present king of France, there's no object in the world that it picks out. Okay? So now let's consider a sentence where we use that definite description as a subject. So the sentence that we're considering now, this is premise one, is the present king of France is bald. Now, Russell says, as a matter of intuition, or how things seem when we consider this sentence, the present king of France is bald, is that this sentence seems false. So if someone tries to tell you that the present king of France is bald, you, the intuition is that that sentence is false, okay, because there's no present king of France. So, in premise two, we say, since there is no king of France, presently there's no king of France right now, if the definite description, the present king of France, is a genuine referring expression, i.e. a Phrygian name, then the sentence in one is neither true nor false. Okay, so just I'm going to scroll up to what we talked about in last in the last video just to review, which was that for genuine referential expressions or Phrygian proper names their truth and falsity of the, the truth of and falsity of sentences containing those names depends only on some object whether or not some particular object picked out has a property the sentence says it does okay now to return to the the sentence we're now considering the present king of france is bald that means that if the definite description, the present king of France, were a genuine referring expression, then the sentence, the present king of France is bald, would be neither true nor false. Okay? When I was introducing genuine referring expressions above, I talked about how, in the case where there's a sentence, including one without a referent, for Frege, it might be called nonsense. Now, I mentioned then that there's an important subtlety here, so I'll mention that in a bit more detail, which is that for Frege, he considers the possibility that a name may have no reference but still have a sense. So even though a sentence containing an empty or defective Fregean proper name may be neither true nor false, it still not it still might not be completely nonsense. Okay, so that's the important qualification. 
But what matters for the present argument is that when there are genuine referring expressions with, which have no referent, which are empty or defective in that way, then sentences containing them, such as the present king of France is bald, um, let, on the assumption that the present king of France, that definite description is a genuine referring expression, then that sentence will lack a truth value. It'll be neither true nor false. However, Russell says, and this is again for premise one, the sentence, the present king of France is bald, actually just seems to be false. And so combining one and two, we get the sub-conclusion that the definite description, the present king of France, is not a referring expression. So, and this is the fourth step of the argument, he, Russell says, if we treat the present king of France and all other definite descriptions with his theory of definite descriptions, this will predict that the sentence, the present king of France is bald, is false. So this is abductive support for the theory of definite descriptions. It provides evidence for the theory of, of definite descriptions, which Russell has given, because Russell's theory explains how sentences which contain definite descriptions that do not in fact pick anything out seem to be false. Whereas if those definite descriptions were treated as Phrygian proper names, as genuine referring expressions, then sentences containing empty definite descriptions would be neither true nor false, which Russell says is not how things seem to be. Now let's move on to another argument. The second argument goes as follows, and this is the argument from excluded middle. So the first premise is what is called in logic the law of excluded middle. And this law says every single sentence is either true or false, is either one of the two truth values. So what this law says is that there's no truth value gaps. There can be no sentences which are neither true nor false. So intuitively think about, for instance, a couple uh, other sentences, just simple things. So for instance, for instance, the sentence, snow is white. The idea is that as a matter of logic, this sentence is either true or false. Snow is white or it isn't. As it happens, it's true for us that snow is white. But it is possible that it could be false. But what the law of excluded middle says is not possible is that this sentence or any other lacks a truth value. Every single claim we make, according to the law of excluded, excluded middle, has to be either true or false. There's no middle possibility between truth or falsity. So that's what premise one says. Premise two says that if the definite description, the present king of France, were a referring expression, then the sentence, the present king of France is bald, would be neither true nor false. So again, this is the same um, idea as in the second premise of the first argument. Okay, so again, treating definite descriptions, for example, the present king of France, as referring expressions or as genuine referring expressions means that there's going to be sentences that are neither true nor false. But as we said, it's not possible for there to be sentences that are either true, that are neither true nor false. That means, and this is the sub conclusion three, that the present king of France, that definite description, is not a referring expression. And now, so what 1 to 3 show, just like what 1 to 3 of the first argument show, is that definite descriptions are not referring expressions, are not genuine referring expressions, and so Frege's view of them is incorrect, according to these arguments. 
And then the fourth step of the second argument is the same as the fourth, fourth step of the first one, which is to say, look, my, I, Russell's, my theory of definite descriptions as describing or quantificational expressions can explain what's happening when we say the present king of France is bald. Okay, and in this case, with the argument from the excluded middle, the theory of description shows how sentences with definite descriptions satisfy the law of excluded middle. So again, this is more abductive evidence for Russell's theory. Okay, abductive means, just to be clear, when you talk about abductive evidence or an abductive inference, that means it's something like an inference to the best explanation. So what subconclusion three of the last of this argument and the last one show is that definite descriptions are not referring expressions. And then the final step says that the best explanation for what they are, if they're not referring expressions, or if they're not these genuine Phrygian names, is Russell's theory itself. So the arguments show that there has to be some other treatment of definite, definite descriptions that then Frege gives. And the other treatment Russell proposes is his own. The third argument is the argument from belief reports. So the first premise is as follows. If n and n prime are referring expressions, if they're genuine referring expressions, then they can be equivalently used to describe someone's beliefs. That is, it will be that a sentence of the form S believes that n is phi is true just in case the sentence of the form S believes that n prime is phi is true. So, Premise 2 says, if the morning star and the evening star are referring expressions, then the following two sentences share the same truth value. Plato believed that the morning star rose in the morning, and Plato believed that the evening star rose in the morning. So if it's the case, according to Russell, that the morning star and the evening star, those definite descriptions, are genuine Phrygian names. Then, a sentence, Plato believed that the morning star rose in the morning, should be true just in case Plato believed that the evening star rose in the morning is true. And this is because in these two sentences talking about Plato's beliefs, all we've changed are these two names, the morning star and the evening star. However, three says, premise three says, these two sentences about Plato's beliefs do not share truth value. So as in the example given in the first lecture, it's true that Plato believed that the morning star rose in the morning, but since Plato didn't realize that the morning star is the evening star, it's not true that Plato believed that the evening star rose in the morning. Hence, four, and this follows from two and three, which I haven't indicated on the handout, but I probably will on what I upload. So subconclusion four follows from two and three. It follows that the definite description the morning star and the definite description the evening star are not referring expressions, they're not Phrygian names. Whereas we have the final abduct abductive step again, as with the other ones in five, which is that the theory of definite descriptions shows how definite descriptions interact with attitude verbs. So we should accept that view. Now, one thing I've left out of these arguments is how exactly the Russell's theory of descriptions explains what's happening in these cases. So 
he goes over in the paper and I would like to talk in office hours with anyone about in detail about how these explanations go. But what's crucial here and what these arguments show as I presented them on this handout is that definite descriptions are not what Frege thought they are, i.e. genuine referring expressions. Okay? There is something different, and that something different, Russell claims, is that they are quantificational in the way which we talked about in the last video. Okay, so now is a final argument for Russell's theory of definite descriptions. Now, the idea behind this argument is that definite descriptions interact with modals in a way that referring expressions do not. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about this argument and right now, partly because in fact in the next lecture on Kripke, we will be going into more detail into these ideas of how different kinds of referential expressions interact with uh, modals. So, to be clear, modals are words like might, must, necessarily, possibly. And the argument here, which I'll quickly give you, is that the way that definite descriptions interact with these modal words, for example, the word might, is different than the way in which genuine proper names do. So let's consider 11. 11a is a sentence which is as follows. The first man in space might have been American. Now, this sentence, if you think about it, has two different readings. There's two different ways of interpreting what this sentence is saying. The first way is in 11b, and I've called this reading one. So the first way of interpreting this is as follows. When you say the first man in space might have been American, what you're saying is that the person who was in fact in our world, the first person in space, whose name, by the way, is Yuri Gagarin, what you're saying is that person might have been American. So to give a bit more background, the first person in space in our world was in fact someone from the USSR of this name, Yuri Gagarin, who I've introduced, okay? So in actual fact, the first man in space was not American. He was Russian or Soviet. Now, when we say the first man in space might have been American, on this first reading, what we're saying is that the person who was in fact the first person in space, i.e. the Soviet, Yuri, what we're saying is that he himself might have been American. So for instance, it's worth saying it's possible that he could have snuck over to the US as a boy, say. So that's a possibility. That this person, who was the first man in space, might actually have been secretly American. Now that's one way of interpreting what we're saying when we say the first man in space might have been American. But there's another way of interpreting what that claim means. And this is in 11c, reading 2, and it's as follows. What we're saying is that the Americans might have managed to send someone to space before the Soviets. So think again about 11a. Another way of interpreting what it means when I say the first man in space might have been American is as follows the first man in space might not have been Yuri Gagarin, but someone else who was American. So there's two, so this sentence, the first man in space might have been American, is ambiguous, you might think. There's two different ways of interpreting it. One is saying the first man who in fact went to space might have actually been an American. And the other way of interpreting it is that someone different than who actually 
went to space, you might have been the first to space. And that other person could have been American. Okay, there's a similar ambiguity in 12. So just to review, what 11 is showing us is that the way there, there's a certain way in which the definite description, the first man in space, the specific way in which it interacts with the word might or the modo in this sentence. And it interacts with the modo in such a way that gives rise to an ambiguity. Okay, and now there's a similar ambiguity in 12. So consider 12a. The winner might not have won. So suppose we're talking about some kind of contest or race. Now, there's a similar ambiguity when I say the winner might not have won. On the first reading, what I might be saying is that the person who in fact won might not have. And this is a coherent possibility. So in every race or contest, there is a winner. Or putting aside draws, of course. So. What I'm trying to say is that clearly in certain contests or races, there is in fact one person who wins. But it's entirely possible that someone else could have won. Okay? And so what the first reading of 12a is, is simply saying that the person who in fact won the race might not have i.e. that when I say the winner might not have won, what I'm saying is that things could have turned out differently and someone else, someone who lost, might have actually won. But now in 12c, here's another reading. If I tell you the winner might not have won, you could interpret me as saying that the person who won might not have won. But in this reading too, this is actually an impossible or an absurd thing to say. Okay. It's impossible that the person who won didn't win. And that's a different claim than the claim that the person who in fact won might not have. So 12a, just like 11a, is ambiguous with how the definite description, the winner, interacts with the modal might. So what that shows is that definite descriptions interact with modals in a certain way which gives rise to an ambiguity. But now, I want you to, to consider the sentences in 13 where we have names or other kinds of referential expressions interacting with modals. In 13a, consider the sentence, Gagarin might not have been the first man in space. Now this is very similar to 11a, but it doesn't have a similar ambiguity. When you say 13a, Gagarin might not have been the first man in space, there's only one reading of this, which is that this, part this particular person, Gagarin, might not have been the first man in space. Someone else might have. Okay, so this 13a only has one reading, it's not ambiguous, and this one reading kind of corresponds to the reading 1 in 11b. Now in 13a, 13b, sorry, consider the following. I might not have been the teacher of this course. So here as well, there is not an ambiguity. All it's saying is that there's a specific person, me, who might not have been the teacher of this class. And finally, with 13c, consider the following. Plato might not have been a philosopher. This sentence, as well, is not ambiguous. The way that the name Plato is interacting with the modal might does not give rise to two different readings. All there is is the reading on which you're talking about a specific person, Plato, who is in fact Plato, and saying that this person might not have been a philosopher. 
So in conclusion, comparing the way that what might be seen as genuine referring expressions like Gagarin, I, Plato, considering how they interact with modals shows that they interact in a different way than definite descriptions such as the winner and the first man in space. And since these expressions behave differently, one can conclude that definite descriptions are not genuine referring expressions.